guys, welcome to another lovely edition of Patio Productions, where we review all things calculus um, in Speedy Gonzalez form, right? Speedy, speedy form. And um, just, uh, you know, so you can uh, head on off to those FRQs. So let's go ahead and start this um, guide. Today is going to be about unit five. Okay. Now unit five is still about derivatives. Okay. So we're still talking about derivatives for unit five and, um, here we go for unit five, but today we're going to talk about sort of like more analytical things and less like, um, like uh, doing things. So the last unit, unit four, we did like related rates and we did um, the velocity and all that good stuff. So now we're going to talk about more like general things and, and kind of a little bit about graphing. Okay. And so these are some of the topics. There's a little bit more on another screen um, about uh, what we can use our derivatives for. And so this is what's going to come up as a little bit wordy. But I want to just talk about what the what College Board has put forth about um, notation and um, how we say things, the verbiage of stuff. OK, so you have to be very, very specific. OK, so when it says like, does um, does this function G have a relative min or max at 10? Um, if you write something like and so this is like like words that they were suggesting for us to use. That, you know, like G has neither a relative maximum or minimum at X equals 10 because you see how you're sort of like restating the question. So think about all the times that you learn stuff in your um, English classes about restating the question, like go back to like a middle school where you restate the question and then you answer it. Okay. You're using the words because, um, if you are, um, it, it says if you're given a graph of F prime, the derivative, um, say things about the graph of the derivatives. So you can say like, you know, the function is concave up on this interval because the graph of F prime is increasing on this interval. You should always refer to the things by name, like by F or F prime or F double prime. Um, don't ever use the word it. So it is going to not be in our vocabulary or the function because there could be several functions that we're talking about. So make sure you're using precise language. That's like really, really, really important. Um, and so like this would be like a really bad answer. OK, so if you just say like, oh, the graph's going up because that's what it looks like or um, the, the graph is increasing because it's going up, you're just restating what it is. You're not proving why. So um, don't say things like that. OK, so just some general advice on how to write things properly. And so if you are checking your work and you're finding that you're doing this, be like, ooh. Um, Boo, boo on you. You got to figure out some good stuff to to um, to make that better. OK, so um, the next thing is um, let's talk about after we talked about that general notation, let's talk about just some specifics in this uh, unit five. So one of them is the mean value theorem. So remember, the mean value theorem says that um, you, we've done these pictorially. We've done them algebraically. They do love the picture kind, just so you know, um, if you the mean value theorem says that if you are, uh, if the function is continuous and differentiable, then there's definitely a spot, at least one of them, where the instantaneous rate of change equals the average rate of change. So remember, instantaneous rate of change is going to be your derivatives. And then um, instantaneous rate of change is the derivative. Average rate of change is just the regular slope. And so what that means is that the slope at the end points, because it is going to be a closed interval right here, okay? The slope um, given like the the from the edges, the regular slope, the derivative is going to equal that somewhere in that interval. In notation, we say that this is F prime of C is equal to F of B minus F of A all over B minus A. Um, and lots of times they want you to like, yeah, like show what it is, but then also like um, also like find the C is, is, is the thing that they like to have us do. OK. Um, when we talk about extreme values, um, basically, guys, you're you're just saying that definitely on a closed interval, a function is going to have at least a minimum and at least a maximum. Um, if there's a zero spot, OK, if there's a zero spot or it, um, the derivative fails to exist, then those are your critical points. Right. We talked about critical points. Critical points are what we use. Um, all of your relative extrema uh, occur at critical points, but just because you're a critical point doesn't mean that you are for sure like a max or a min. It's just they always happen there. 
Um, if we're trying to think about um, places where things are increasing or decreasing and all these things. So like all of these topics right here are very like this one and this one and this one all tangled up with each other. And so if you really think about it, like what did we do? Well, we always use the first derivative. We did the critical values. Um, one of our strategies was to put the critical values on a number line. Wasn't that very helpful to do like a number line? And then you figured out where each one was um, increasing or decreasing um, that interval. I always like to label my, um, I love to label. I think you should too. Label your, your number line. So like if it's the derivative, put like an F prime next to it. Or if it's the second derivative, you know, put an F double prime next to it. It's like, just do what you need to do to, to label which one. Um, you're going to figure out your intervals if it goes from like increasing to decreasing. So remember, we just did it with our hands. If it goes from increasing to decreasing, then it's a maximum. If it goes um, uh, decreasing to increasing, that's a minimum. And you might want to say those words, right? You could say, since the derivative um, goes from positive to negative, we know the function goes increasing to decreasing. So um, f of x has a maximum. Like you want to say those words um, explaining yourself. If for some reason the, um, the number line goes from a plus to a plus or a negative to a negative at a spot, nothing happens there, right? If you wanted to find the actual coordinate of these things, you're going to plug in the x values into the original function, of course, because the original function is where you would get your coordinates. Um, if you sometimes instead of doing a number line, they like to do the second derivative test. So you do the, uh, oh, excuse me, <laughs> said, the, said the wrong thing, got ahead of myself, JK. Um, this one says if you're trying to find the absolute extrema, right? <clears throat> so absolute extremes or global extremes, those are words that they like to use. You basically do all the things that you did here, right? You do all these things, but you also have to check the end points. That is a very, very fun thing for them to do. And then usually like the visual hint for this is that the interval is going to be closed. Um, oh, uh, so when they're looking for absolute extrema, you definitely, definitely want to do the um the 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 edges also and just kind of compare all the like the inside maximums and minimums with your um endpoints to figure out which one's truly the biggest and truly the smallest <clears throat> So now the second uh, derivative oh, is always going to talk, uh, is going to lead us to concavity. Um, basically, you know, you just kind of do the same thing as we did with the first derivative test. You find derivative, critical values, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to be labeling this guy with an F double prime if we do end up having to do a number line. We are concave up when your second derivative is positive. We're concave down when it's negative. Points of inflection happens when it switches. You can also use the second derivative test to test for your local extrema. Um, and sometimes this is just cleaner when making a number line is too clunky, or maybe it's actually impossible. Doing the second derivative test is very, very popular for, um, for, the, for free response questions. So if you're able to use a critical value from the first derivative. So both of these are starting with a critical value. So this is a critical value of the first derivative, a critical value of the second derivative. If it's where it equals zero, then you take the second derivative and you plug in that number. If it is less than zero we, at that spot, we know that it would be concave down. And then so this point right here would have to be a maximum. On this one, if it was concave up, right, it would have to be a minimum, okay? And so then you don't have to do the number line. When we sketch the graphs, I think it's lovely to sketch the graphs to um, to kind of just make your number lines. This is very, very, very popular. They like to give you like a picture of the first derivative and then they're like, now graph the real thing. And so you kind of like translate the information from the picture into a number line for the first derivative. Okay, perfect. And then you're going to translate that information into the second derivative because the second derivative would be the slopes of the first derivative. Mm -hmm. You make another number line and then you kind of just like try to match them up and then think to yourself, hmm, is that like in this particular section from this number to this number, it, it happens to be decreasing but concave up. And then you think about what that picture might look like. So here are like little, just like little pieces of pictures 
that I thought would be good to illustrate what's happening. There's really only four things and you just got to be able to put them together. So this would be an example of increasing in concave up because right, it's concave up right here. But then as you go, it's going up. This is um, increasing the functions increasing, but it's concave down. This little piece is going down as we go to the right and is concave up. This is decreasing as we go to the right and is concave down. So if you can just do all those four little pieces and then put them together, you'll be able to create a beautiful, beautiful function. But again, I'm really thinking that having those two number lines, one illustrating the first derivative and one illustrating the second derivative would be an awesome choice. Um, I think uh, d d this is what I was saying, like just connecting all those pieces together is really that just try to turn everything into a number line. So that's basically what was my point on this guy right here. And then these optimization problems. So optimization problems are probably the hardest part about an optimization problem is that you have to make the um, equation. So I always find that that's difficult. So developing the model is probably the hardest part. Um, but after you do that, it's just a matter of finding like maxes or mins. So um, usually they want you to like maximize something or minimize something. So once you finally get the equation, then you just like let your other skills take over. You're like, oh, I know how to find maxes and mins. I know how to take critical values and look at a number line or use the second derivative test. Um, and then just make sure that you're thinking about like what the labels need to be, what the um, if there's a, like some sort of a, a sentence that you need to write down or maybe you have to go back and find other answers. So just think about like what they're asking you to do. Okay, so again, that was it for unit uh, five. Just a quick little reminder, again, just working with derivatives. Um, this guy uh, for today happens to have um, one part A question and two part B questions. You're gonna um, answer those. You're going to do your diligent work, best, best, best work to figure out if you can do these by yourself because remember, you're taking the AP exam. You're going to answer those. You're going to score them with the attached scoring guides. And then you are then going to write in your journal Okay, uh, what your um, what your thing is going to be now I did actually do a date change for the journal entry to be finished because I said it was due like on Friday and that's way too soon. So I'm giving you till Sunday to get uh, the all five of your unit things done. Um, type into the journal and then submit that to me and then I'll just be checking that out and that will be an, a separate score and I'm just going to kind of like peruse it and I think I'm going to put it in the, in the other category as opposed to the homework category just to get us some other points and other places. So I really hope that you guys are keeping up with your stuff. Um, remember guys, it's this is not like punishment time or anything weird like that. We're really, really just trying to make sure let me just get my face on here again, that you are prepared for the AP exam. Guys, I so want you to pass this AP exam. And because it's different, we got to just work really hard on these free response questions. So I want you getting in there, practicing them, uh, uh, analyzing yourself, checking your work, um, thinking to yourself, what do I need to practice? What am I totally good at? And I'm like, put that baby to bed. I am done. Right. Good job, me. Excellent work. Um, and then what are the things that you're like, oh, like... I need to practice those just a little bit more, okay? So just think about that, and I think you guys will be golden. So have a lovely day. Hope you enjoyed another short video. Let's do our fanfare music to lead us out of here. And you know what I don't think I did need today? Any need ta-da's. So let's do a ta-da. Excellent job. I will see you guys another time. Bye. See ya.